Um, so to start over again, today we're looking at ending the lease. Um, so this is an area that is ripe for dispute. So as a property litigation partner at Gunner Cook, um, this is one of the areas which I work on a lot. Um, so in terms of proactive approach to the end of the lease, this can make a huge difference because you can anticipate the problems that you might come across. And you can also minimise levels of dispute and also the amount of losses that you might incur as a result. So why does that matter? Well, it allows you to anticipate workflow, you can avoid or minimise issues, you can keep control of the process at the end, you're not reacting to it, it's not running away with you. It saves costs, so you have to remember that you won't recover um, a significant proportion of your costs in any dispute. Um, and it also minimises losses in respect of things such as dilapidations and voids. So today we're going to be doing a bit of a whistle-stop tour um, around a number of issues surrounding the end of the lease. Um, each one of these could probably take up a day of training unto itself, so I'm really only going to be pulling out the very key points on them. Um, if there are any questions that come up, then please do email me as usual after the webinar, and I'll be very happy to pick up on some more of the detail. So we're going to be having a look at security of tenure under the Landlord and Tenant Act, uh, forfeiture and possession, uh, surrendering leases, what to do about dilapidations. We'll have a quick look at tenant insolvency and how that can affect the end of the lease. And also then having a quick look at trespassers and how that fits into the termination of a lease that will make sense as we go along. OK, so let's have a start by looking at security of tenure. So what's the qualifying criteria? It's found in part two, section 23 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954. And subject to the provisions of this act, this part of the act applies to a tenancy. So it only applies to tenancies, not licenses. And it's where the, the property is in the tent is comprised of the tenancy. And it includes property that's occupied by a tenant for the purposes of a business carried out by them. So if you have somebody in a property carrying out a business where they're occupying under a tenancy, then the chances are they are going to get protection from the 1954 Act. Now, 1954 Act makes a lot more sense when you think about the history of how the Act came about. Prior to 1954, there was a real problem uh, for businesses, and obviously the country was still trying to get the economy built back up um, following the war. Um, the issue that they had was businesses would build up goodwill at their premises. Everybody would know where the business is, they would build up staff and so on, and then a landlord would find someone else who could perhaps pay higher rent or change their mind about what they wanted to do with the property, and that business was turfed out on very short notice. This usually meant that most of the businesses that that happened to folded. It wasn't good for the economy. It wasn't good for employment. So the government tried to do something about this by giving some form of security to businesses so that once you've got a lease of a business property and you start building your business, you could have some confidence that you were going to be there for a long term or at least that you were going to be given a sensible amount of notice. Obviously, not everybody wants to be involved in that. So they also gave people the option to opt out of these provisions. And so you will find that some leases are, have opted out of security of tenure. But you have to be careful because if you have opted out, you allow the tenant to carry on in the property after the end of the tenancy, then they may actually acquire security of tenure um, by carrying on in that periodic paying of rent after the end of the tenancy term. So there are some exclusions to the 1954 Act. Um, most of these you probably won't come across very often. Agricultural holdings and um, farm business tenancies, mining leases, uh, leases linked to employment, anything to do with railway, military, dockyards, um, or people that are running their businesses from home. Um, they're all excluded. The other exclusion is tenancies for six months or less. Um, that only applies, though, to um, tenancies that have got a certainty of term. So if you've got a periodic tenancy, um, that does not apply. So if you've got a periodic tenancy where you're paying month to month, for example, security of tenure can arise before six months is up. 
In terms of those six months as well, you have to remember that if you have successive tenancies, so say they're three months at a time, if you add them all together and they come up to more than 12 months, then it can gain protection. Um, predecessors as well, if they were occupying, running the same business, say they've sold their business and a new company has come in to take up the tenancy and carry on that business, and their occupation of that previous occupier will be taken into account. So it's a lot easier to get security of tenure than you might think. The other thing you need to think about then, as I mentioned, was this holding over after the end of the term. And that is something that, um, that, comes, uh, that happens a lot. Um, so holding over after the end of the term. Avoiding the issue in the first place is knowing when the end of your term is and having a discussion with the tenant beforehand. So the tenant could be um, the tenant could be deciding that they're going to leave. They could want a new lease. You might want to vary the term of the lease. There are a number of different ways of dealing with the issue if they want to remain in occupation, but you need to have foresight in order to deal with that. In terms of them, them holding over without any formal arrangement being put in place, you need to be very careful if they, if, if they are paying rent or you are accepting rent, because if you start accepting rent on a periodic basis, then what you will have created is a new periodic tenancy. And that's when the potential comes in for them to have security of tenure. So thinking about the nature of the occupancy that they end up with then, they could be um, a tenant on sufferance, um, which means that they are just carrying on in the almost akin to a trespasser. Um, you could count them as a trespasser, though the normal rules for trespassers will not apply if it's a tenant who was initially let in with permission. Could have a tenancy at will, and this is usually what's put in place if you are in the process of negotiating a new tenancy but you don't have time to complete those negotiations before the end of the term. And a tenancy at will runs from day to day. Um, it, it, tends to, it can be ended at any time. It tends to go on just during that negotiation period. It's not a long-term solution as it doesn't give you the full protection and structure of a full lease. And then the other option, as I said, is this periodic tenancy. So the big giveaway for a periodic tenancy is that rent is being demanded and paid on a regular basis. So if your tenant is in there continuing occupation, paying the rent, there's no negotiations carrying on, and there's nothing being said to them that they're not going to get security of tenure, then this is the point at which it comes as quite a surprise to a lot of landlords that they haven't, um, they haven't been able to get the property back when they want it because security of tenure has been obtained. So looking at ending a secured tenancy then. So there are, there are a couple of ways in which a tenancy that has got security of tenure can be ended. The first is that the tenant can just leave at the end of the term. They don't have to, uh, they don't have to carry on after the end of the term if they don't want to. If they go past the end of the term, then they have to give three months notice under section 27. The landlord wants to give notice, it then becomes more difficult. So the landlord's standard notice for ending the tenancy is section 25 and they have to give between 6 and 12 months notice. Alternatively, if the tenant has requested a new tenancy under section 26, the landlord can serve a counter notice saying that they need them to leave. Now there are a number of grounds on which the landlord can rely can only rely on grounds A to G of section 31 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954. So ground A is if the premises are in disrepair, B covers arrears of rent, C covers breaches of contract, and D covers suitable alternative accommodation. And these are called the fault grounds. Um, these are grounds where um, the tenant is considered to be doing something wrong or at fault for not moving to the alternative accommodation. You then get into what's called the non-fault grounds, which is E to G, which is the tenancy was created by a subletting, the landlord's got an intention to develop, 
or the landlords intending to occupy the property themselves. Now, these are known as no fault um, grounds because the tenant hasn't actually done anything wrong. And in that case, that means that they are entitled to statutory compensation, which is usually calculated as a multiplier of the rateable value of the property, depending on how long they have been in the property. The other thing to bear in mind for um, landlords is that if you are seeking to get the property back on the basis of disrepair, rent arrears, uh, other breaches of covenant, or it being a subletting issue, um, then those are discretionary points that the court does not have to give you um, back for possession of the property. It can let them stay, it can let the tenant stay in place if it's felt that's more equitable. In terms of um, there being alternative accommodation, the landlord wanting to develop or occupy the property, and those are mandatory grounds, but obviously you need to persuade the court that you meet the criteria. So as you can see, it can make life a lot more difficult for landlords who want to get their properties back. Well, it can also cause, you know, it can be quite, it can be quite difficult for tenants as well who want to leave earlier. But we'll have a look at surrender in a, in a moment to see how that might be achieved. But in terms of landlords, the key takeaway here is be aware of whether the tenancy is under the 1954 Act provisions and don't assume just because it was contracted out initially that if they've been holding over, they haven't now got that protection. So moving on then to have a look at forfeiture and possession. So forfeiture and possession is usually a very last resort if things have gone wrong with the tenant. And there are some questions that landlords really need to ask themselves first. The first thing is, do you know what's going on with the tenant? Is this a temporary glitch in cash flow? Is this the tenant is going under? Um, is there a problem with the property? You need to know what's going on. And having that good communication that we've talked about throughout this series will really help you with that. When you're deciding whether forfeiture is the right thing to do, you need to consider, are you going to be able to find a new tenant quickly in the current market? Because if you can't, you may find that you're then going to be on the hook for various rates, um, utilities and so on for the property and are going to have to upkeep it. You might want to consider if there are any original tenants who are who have an ARGA on the property or guarantors and what's the position going to be of you forfeit for them? Are they still going to be on the hook or is their guarantee drafted in such a way that they would be released as well? Um, if you've got a guarantee that allows a guarantor to step into the shoes of the tenant if the lease is forfeited, do you want that guarantor to be the new tenant? And or, or perhaps you might be thinking about redeveloping the property. Um, so you could be looking at whether it's forfeiture is going to be a good opportunity for development and the timing of that. If you're looking at the property being left empty for a period of time after you forfeited because you don't have a new tenant lined up and the property market isn't right to find one easily, then what you need to consider as well is the security of the property, because at that point, that's when squatters and trespassers become a much more significant issue. So before you get to forfeiture, you should consider all of your alternatives. You might want to consider whether it's a, if it's a temporary issue, whether you want to draw down on the deposit, if you know that the tenant is going to be able to make the deposit back up again. You might want to ask the guarantor to pay rent arrears or to deal with disrepair. Uh, you could issue a statutory demand threatening the company um, for not paying its rent. Uh, you, could, you could consider going through the commercial rent arrears recovery procedure CRA, or you could apply to the county court for a CCJ in respect of a judgment debt. Um, in respect of repair, if it's during the course of the tenancy, uh, obviously, you can go in and do the repairs under Jarvis and Harris clauses. Uh, that's where you give notice if they're not done. You go and do the repairs and you recover the costs as a debt for the repairs in full. Um, and as, a, as another option, you could also ask the court perhaps for an injunction requiring specific performance of one of the obligations. But you have got a lot of options there um, before you decide to go straight to forfeiture.
Um, if you do decide you're going to go for forfeiture, then make sure that you've got a plan as to how you're going to manage the forfeiture and that it is definitely the best way to go. So the first thing you need to know if you are looking at doing forfeiture as your best option is, is the right to forfeit reserved in the lease? Now, if your lease has been properly drafted um, and it's been it's been done by a solicitor, then they will have put a forfeiture provision in there. It's when you get homemade or, or quite um, uh, or, or quite short leases that people have pulled off the internet where you tend to have a problem. But it must be expressly reserved in the lease. If it's not, then it's extremely difficult for you to be able to forfeit a lease. You will need to go to court and it's going to be very difficult to prove that you have a right to do so before the end of the term. Um, you need to be clear as well about what the tenant's done. Is it a case that they've not paid rent or is it a breach of covenant in that they've not done the repairs or they've breached some other term of the lease? Or is it the fact that they've gone insolvent? Because how you deal with each of those is going to be very different. If it's the case that they've not paid rent, then you can simply re-enter the property peacefully or you can issue proceedings for possession. If it's a breach of another covenant in the tenancy, then you need to serve a Section 146 notice under the Law of Property Act 1925. Um, that's for anything other than non-payment of rent. And what that does is it gives the tenant an opportunity to rectify the breach if they still don't do that within a reasonable period of time, then you are permitted then to either re-enter or issue proceedings for possession. Now, what is a reasonable amount of time will depend entirely on what the breach is. If it's substantial disrepair, then it depends how, much, how long would be reasonable to expect them to do that, those works. If the issue is that they've got insolvent, um, then you may need permission of the court, and we'll come on to that in a, in, a, in a while, to look at when permission of the court is needed. The other thing to bear in mind when you're looking at the right to forfeit is to make sure that you haven't waived that right. Um, you need to, if you know about the breach, you shouldn't perform any action that recognises the lease as continuing. And the most obvious thing that happens is that agents or companies through the automated system will carry on demanding or accepting rent. If you carry on demanding or accepting rent, then you are going to be seen as treating the lease as continuing and you will have waived your right to forfeit and you will need to wait for the right to forfeit to arise again before you can take that action. You should also bear in mind that some of the other options that I mentioned earlier will also waive your right to forfeit. So, for example, if you recover your funds by way of a debt claim and the, and the tenant pays it, um, then obviously they're not going to be in arrears anymore. But if you uh, also, if you start the process for the, um, the CRA process for recovery against goods in the property, that can also waive your right to forfeit. So make sure that the right is there in the first place. So assuming that we're happy the right is there, how can you get back in? Well, the usual way that we get most people back in is peaceful re-entry. Um, so rent arrears, you can use, do this straight away. If it's not rent arrears, you've served your section 146 and nothing's been done. And essentially, you go in and you change the locks. Now, it cannot be done if someone is physically in the property and is opposing that re-entry. So for this reason, peaceful re-entry is usually affected outside of business hours and you will find bailiffs and locksmiths who are willing to help you either very early hours of the morning or late at night. So what do you do if you can't get peaceful re-entry? Well, in that case, what you can do is you issue possession proceedings. And the forfeiture takes place as soon as those proceedings are served. The remainder of the proceedings is simply for getting the property back. So assuming we've now got possession of our property, what's the effect on everybody else? Well, the effect on the under tenants is that because their tenancy um, 
came out of the tenancy that has been forfeited, the subtenancy also comes to an end. But bear in mind that they are entitled, along with the mortgagee, to apply for relief from forfeiture. So you always need to make sure that you notify third parties with an interest before forfeiting a lease. So what is relief from forfeiture? Well, this is an application that can be made to the court in order to reinstate the tenancy. Only the court can grant relief from forfeiture. You can't make an agreement with a tenant. Oops, I didn't mean to uh, forfeit. I'd like to go back on that now. Uh, let's go back to where we were. You would have to grant them a new lease. Only the court can give the relief from forfeiture. It reinstates the original lease. Um, if another lease has been granted in the meantime, what it does is it elevates the new lease to a head lease, but still allows the original tenant back into occupation. So when can a tenant apply for relief from forfeiture or a subtenant or a mortgagee for that matter? Well, if you're following the proceedings route, it's up to when the possession order is made. So while the proceedings route can be more expensive and time consuming, it can actually give more certainty because as soon as you've got your possession order, you know that nobody can be waiting in the wings to ask for relief from forfeiture. It's more difficult when you deal with re-entry because with re-entry, as long as it's still equitable to do so, the court can grant relief from forfeiture. And it really depends then on what the judge thinks when they're presented with the particular facts of the case. So what that can mean is that you've got your property back, but there is an uncertainty hanging there as to whether or not the tenant is going to apply for relief from forfeiture, which can make it very difficult when you're trying to decide what to do when reletting the property to another party. Um, so if you are going to use re-entry as your primary method of forfeiture, then what you need to think about is what position is that tenant in? If you know that the tenant is basically being wound up, doesn't have any money, isn't going to be able to rectify the breaches um, and is probably not going to make a fuss, then peaceful re-entry is probably a great way to go. If you think that they are going to come out fighting, then the answer is to go through the proceedings route, because otherwise you could have some a, a question mark over your property for at least 12 months, if not longer. So moving on then to surrender. Um, now, I mentioned earlier, if you've got a situation where both parties want to end the lease sooner, so for example, both the landlord and tenant have agreed that they want to end the lease partway through the term, but there's no break option that they can operate, or, for example, the tenant wants to leave sooner than the three months notice it's got to give under Section 27 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954, or that they want to agree to leave sooner than the notice period that's needed to be given by the um, landlord. Um, there are ways of affecting this. The key thing here, though, is that it's by mutual agreement. You can't unilaterally surrender um, a lease. Both parties have to do something. So when you're organised and you're surrendering a lease in an organised fashion, then what you would normally expect to see is an agreement for surrender. Now, if you are surrendering a lease that has security of tenure, you need to remember that there is a process to follow alongside the agreement for surrender in order to clear off that security and make sure that valid notice has been given. So it's 14 days advance notice or a statutory declaration under section 38A brackets 4 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954 that governs that process. So just make sure if you are going down that organised route for agreement for surrender, just make sure if there is security of tenure that you've dealt with that extra bit of procedure to solve any problems coming up in future. Once you've agreed where the surrender is going to take place, um, then it will be affected by a deed of surrender that's 
registered that's signed by both parties and if you've got a lease that's more than seven years it's registered land registry you can take your deed of surrender to the land registry and they'll close that leasehold title now the other option is what's called by operation of law and this is why i said it's either that the parties have to mutually agree or that they both have to do something so operation of law is implied by the conduct of the landlord and tenant. It's when conduct is inconsistent with the continuation of the lease. So if the landlord is taking back control of the premises, for example, or a head landlord starts accepting rent from an under tenant, from a sub tenant at the direction of the tenant, rather than through the process where the landlord can request rent. If they decide that they're going to accept the keys back but don't state that it's without prejudice so it can be very difficult because you have to be very careful when you're in that situation where say perhaps the tenant wants to surrender a lease but the landlord doesn't want to let them off the hook of what the landlord then does now if you're worried about the security of the property it is possible to take keys back or to change locks provided that you make it very clear that it's being done without prejudice for the continuation of the lease and purely to secure the property. So what's the effect then of a surrender? Well, the tenant is released from paying rent. If rent was paid in advance and they leave partway through a period, they're not entitled to any apportionment. Rent review, if there is a rent review that is ongoing or a rent review that is past due but didn't need to have any notice served to initiate it or anything like that, then the rent review can still be claimed. Um, service charge payments, service charge balancing payments cannot be claimed after a surrender from a tenant. The tenant is liable for past breaches, but not for any future breaches. Um, but what you can do is you can obviously change the position in respect of any of those issues if you are going through the agreement to surrender route and doing a formal documentation. Thinking about the original tenant and the guarantor, bear in mind that they are still liable for past breaches as well, but for nothing that would constitute a breach in the future. And importantly, um, you need to bear in mind that any under leases are not extinguished, even if they are granted in breach of this lease. So if the lease is surrendered, you've still got to deal with the subtenants. Um, so this can be a real issue um, if you've got subtenants sitting in the property. So you will have to do something that works down the chain. In terms of mortgagees, this is another one that people often find difficult. The mortgage survives the surrender, so it stays on the title. If a landlord accepts a surrender from a tenant and the mortgage is still on the title, they then become liable for that mortgage. So there needs to be a mechanism to ensure that the mortgage is released before the surrender is affected. It's also worth bearing in mind that where a landlord has a mortgage on their property, which means that they are going to have to, um, uh, they're going to have to seek permission from their mortgagee before they can consent to a surrender. If they don't get that consent, then the surrender will be rendered invalid. So make sure that you are alive to what is going on with the mortgage lenders around the property. So moving on quickly then to dilapidations. Well, we talked about these in a bit more detail um, in an earlier webinar. But just as a recap, there are options when dealing with disrepair. There is a self-help option, the Jarvis and Harris clause, which means that you can go in, do the repairs, claim the full amount that you, it's cost you, provided the repairs were reasonable, but you can claim the full sum as a debt from your tenant. You could ask for specific performance, or alternatively, you can look for recovery of damages. Now, if you get to the end of the lease and you've not kept on top of the repair obligations, then the only thing that you can do 
is obviously look for recovery of damages because the tenant isn't in there anymore um, for you to ask them to do the work. You can't give them notice under the Jarvis and Harris clause. So all you're looking at is recovery of damages. So you need to be aware of how those damages are assessed. So the first thing is common law. If the works are reasonably required in compliance with the terms of the lease, then in theory, you can recover that cost and you can recover rent for the period over which you have to spend doing those works because obviously you can't re the property while the works are being done. That all sounds great until you step into Section 18 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1927. And this has two effects. The key one that causes a problem here is Section 18.1 which caps your recovery at the diminution in value of the property. So what this means is you take a value of the property with all of the works done, and you take the value of the property as it is now without the works done, and that difference is your diminution in value. And it's usually significantly less than the cost of the works. So if we recap then, if you go in under your Jarvis and Harris clause during the course of the tenancy and make sure you keep up to date with the works, as a landlord, you get the full cost back. If you wait till the end and then try to deal with it in terms of dilapidations, then all you will get is that reduced sum, that diminution in value, which is probably not going to be enough for you to put the property back into dis back into repair so that you can then let it to another pro to another um, tenant. So the second limb then of section 18 that you also need to be aware of is supersession. And basically what this means is if anything is going to happen, would render it pointless doing the works that you are trying to claim. Like, for example, you're going to demolish the property, you're going to renovate it, the new tenants doing full fit out works, anything like that. then obviously that supersedes the sums that you are then seeking to claim. Now you can claim the sums either before you've done the works or after you've done the works. Obviously if you've already done the works as a landlord then it's easier to prove that they were reasonable because you wouldn't have done them if it wasn't reasonable to carry them out. But it is a significant cost that has to be borne in mind. Now the dilapidations protocol is something else you need to be aware of. In order to comply with the court's protocol, which has the very catchy title of the pre-action protocol for claims for damages in relation to the physical state of commercial property at termination of a tenancy, uh, which is what's referred to as the dilapidations protocol, sets out a timetable of actions that need to be taken before you can issue a claim for dilapidations. You have 56 days to serve a schedule and a quantified demand as a landlord, the tenant then has 56 days to respond. Both parties are then required to consider ADR, such as whether you want to get expert determination or mediation or possibly arbitration. Um, and both parties are required to demonstrate that they have done a stock take before they decide to issue proceedings. Um, you need to make sure that you follow through this procedure because if you don't do this and you don't keep, keep to that timetable or you don't follow the procedure at all, then when you go to court, you are at risk as a landlord of criticism from a judge who will also probably consider that your demands are unreasonable because you've acted unreasonably by not following the protocol and you'll also be penalised in costs. So make sure that you follow the protocol. If you get all the way through the protocol, then you have to then remember that you will be adding the court fees on to um, onto your um, dilapidations. Now, most dilapidations that I'm coming across in commercial properties, they can add up quite easily to a few hundred thousand pounds. The court fee for dealing of a claim of that level is £10,000. So that's £10,000 extra immediately that the landlord has to take out of their own pocket, pay to the court just to get the claim started.
Um, so again, if you end up with a lower level of dilapidations, you have to look at the court fees and the cost of taking it through the court and your chances of recovery. And again, you may find that it's not worth it. If you've kept on top of your disrepair during the course of the tenancy, so there's very little to do come the end, you are going to find yourself in a much better position. So then we come on to tenant insolvency. Um, I'm just going to run through this one very quickly, um, just so that you're aware of the different types of insolvency and what effect that can have. So if they enter into a company voluntary arrangement, um, then the landlord is bound by that. That's whether or not you knew about it, um, the vote being made, um, or whether you were part of the qualifying decision procedure. As long as it's been done in the proper way, the landlord is bound by it. Now, you can challenge the CVA within 28 days if it is, it's put you at a significant disadvantage. Um, and you can still, with larger companies, forfeit the lease. What you've got to bear in mind is if you're dealing with a small company, now by a small company, I mean a company that's turnover is less than 10.2 million, it's got a balance sheet less than 5.1 million, and it's got no more than 50 employees. So actually, they could be quite substantive enterprises and still count as a small company. If it's a small company that's in there, then you're going to have a problem because you need the leave of the court then to forfeit the lease or exercise the commercial rent arrears recovery um, or any other step to enforce security against them. If an administrator has been appointed, um, then you should be notified of that appointment by the administrator uh, shortly after their appointment. Again, you have to apply to the court if you want to uh, carry out forfeiture, CRA, or enforce any security. If it's a receiver, be that a private receiver under a charge or an LPA receiver, um, then they, again, should let you know within 28 days of their appointment that they have stepped in to deal with the company. Um, it doesn't give you, it doesn't restrict your ability, though, to forfeiture or to affect CRA and so on in respect of the tenancy. There's two different types of liquidation that you need to be aware of. One is voluntary winding up. You can use CRA, you can sue for rent or forfeit the lease, but you need to bear in mind that the liquidator can apply to the court to restrain you from doing that. And you also need to be aware that the liquidator can disclaim the lease. So they can just say, no, nope, we're just going to get rid of it. Liquidation on compulsory winding up, that you have a restriction on CRA and forfeiture, so you have to apply to the court. And they, again, can disclaim the lease. Now, by disclaiming the lease, what does that then mean? Well, it means that all rights and liabilities of the tenant are disclaimed. But what, it, what you do still get is you do still get liabilities in respect of third parties. So if you've got a previous tenant under the hook um, in respect of an authorised guarantee agreement, an AGA, or you've got a guarantor on the hook, then you will still be able to recover from them. The other thing that you can do is you can reach round that lease and you can serve a notice under Section 81 of the Tribunal Courts and Enforcement Act 2007 on any subtenant and require the subtenant to start paying you rent directly. In terms of whether you get to keep the deposit or not, it depends on how the deposit is being held at that time. <laughs> so as you can see, it's very complicated when it comes to tenant insolvency. There are, depending on how company uh, gets itself into difficulties and what's done to try and resolve that, be it a CVA, liquidation, administration or receivership, um, depends on what you as a landlord can then do. But most of them cause some sort of restriction on your rights as a landlord. So this, again, is the reason why you really need to keep a very close eye on what's going on with your tenant. But the first sign that they might be getting themselves into financial difficulties such as, for example, the lease, uh, the, the rent is being late, um, it's not being paid in accordance with the terms of the lease on the date specified, it's getting later and later, you're having to chase them, that should ring an alarm bell. 
Missed rental payments should also ring an alarm bell. The other thing that should ring an alarm bell is if suddenly you get a rental payment from another party. Now, it may be that somebody is billing the company out, or it could be that the company has been wound up without you being told about it, because in terms of winding up, it's a lot more difficult for you to be told um, that that's occurred because they don't have to notify you as the landlord in the same way that they do with some of the other options. It could be the company's been wound up and another company has been allowed into occupation. You then start accepting rent with them, then that means that you've now got yourself a new tenant, which you didn't pick or vet before they moved into the property. So coming on then to our final topic today, which is trespassers. Um, so how do you deal with trespassers? Well, as we said, re-entry can't be used um, if there's someone physically there and is opposing re-entry. So you can't just take the property back unless there is no one in the property. You would need to issue a possession claim using part 55 of the civil procedure rules. Um, it can only be used against genuine trespassers. So if it's a tenant that has carried on in possession, then you cannot use this against them. And you have to follow all the way through the procedure. And if they still haven't left, you can get the county court bailiffs or high court enforcement officers in to remove them from the property. So that's following through the possession procedure. There is a quicker way of getting them out, which um, for some reason doesn't get used as often as perhaps it should be. And that's an interim possession order. It can only be used on buildings, so it can't be used for land. Um, and you do need to take you do need to give some undertakings. So what will happen is you start your proceedings as usual, possession proceedings. You then apply for this interim order. This is an early order in the proceedings. So the proceedings carry on in the background. So you would need to give an undertaking to the judge that if at the end of those proceedings, in the unlikely event that the defendant uh, is ordered that they can get back into the property, you will let them back in and pay them damages. You've also got to undertake not to damage the premises, grant the right of occupation to anyone else until you've got your final possession order, um, and that you're not going to dispose of the defendant's property. You've got to keep it somewhere safe so that they can go and pick it up. So provided you're happy to give those undertakings, then the court will issue you very quickly with this interim order, and you need to serve that within 48 hours. If the trespassers then don't leave the property, you don't have to wait for the bailiffs to be appointed or anything else. You can simply call the police. The police can go in and they can arrest them because they will have committed offence and they'll be subject to anything between six months in prison or a fine of £5,000. You will still need your final hearing because you will need to get the possession order of the property before you can let it to anybody else. But at least you will have got the trespassers out of the property. Now, it is worth bearing in mind this procedure, particularly if you have got a property where you have forfeited, for example, or the tenant has left and it's been empty for a period of time because it's very easy for trespassers to break into the property and um, and for, for you then to have an added problem on your hands. And I've even come across it um, in shorter periods where the property has been empty. So, for example, there was a large commercial property I dealt with in the middle of London. Um, the tenant had vacated the property. The freehold was being sold. So it was empty for less than three weeks. And within those three weeks, we had over 200 people decide that they were going to go in there and squat in it as part of the Occupy London movement. Um, and that was then a very significant operation to get that property back. Um, so again, you probably want to get people out as soon as possible before the issues get out of hand. Um, and when you can reduce the amount of damage that's going to be caused to your property. In terms of um, the police powers, I'll come back to the injunctions in a second. The police powers, now they can't on commercial property just remove a trespasser for trespassing. But if the trespasser causes damage when they're getting into the property, if they're using utilities without permission, if they're stealing from the property or if they're fly tipping, then the police, if you can get police to cooperate with you, can go in and remove them from the property and arrest them.
but their powers are limited. The best thing to do, as I said, is to get that interim possession order. Now, what's quiatimic injunctions? Well, these have been in the press again recently um, because there was a recent case called Vastant Leeds BV v Persons Unknown that happened just earlier this year in respect to development land. What these are is these are injunctions preventing potential trespass. So no wrong is yet committed, no trespasser is on the property. Um, they can be around an area, so if you're moving trespassers on, you can get the injunction around the area to stop them moving on to another piece of property or another piece of your land. Um, but earlier this year, we did have a state of proceedings where the courts have shown that they are willing to grant them even when there are no trespassers nearby. So if the piece of property or land is right for trespassers for squatters to move into it, and there's a genuinely good reason why you think that might be the case, then the court will look and if they are happy that there is a strong possibility that trespass is going to occur and that damages are not going to be an adequate remedy because you're not going to be able to recover and that you've done everything you can to secure the property then what they will do is they will grant you an in advance injunction against any trespassers and what that means is you've got your injunction in hand so you can get rid of them properly if anything goes wrong so Bear in mind again the options that you've got with trespassers. So as I said, that has been a real whistle stop tour today. I could have gone into any one of those topics in significantly more detail, but, but it's just to start you thinking about the kinds of things you need to be anticipating and thinking about at the end of the lease. Again, if you need any more detail on any of these topics or on any of the other issues that might come up with regards to tenancies, and you've got my details on the screen in front of you, please do drop me an email or give me a call. Thank you very much for listening.